Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for Thursday, September 12th, 2019. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the latest film and TV news. This is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Soretta, and joining me on today's podcast is Slash Film Weekend Editor Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. And Senior Writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of news, a lot of Disney Plus news, because uh, Disney's you know, owns everything. So uh, I guess let's let's dive into that first. Uh, Disney Plus uh, is available if you're in a certain country. Brad, uh, w- what have we learned from this, uh, I guess, test release, beta release? Yeah, so basically the Netherlands is being treated to a two-month free trial, soft pilot uh, opening kind of thing for Disney Plus. Uh, if you live in the Netherlands, you can download the app. Uh, you can sign up for it, and you can enjoy it on your TV, Apple TV, uh, iPad, computer, what have you, uh, and get a taste for what the experience will be like. Uh, it doesn't have any of the original programming in place, things like The Mandalorian or Lady and the Tramp or The World According to Jeff Goldblum or anything like that, because those won't debut until the service actually arrives uh, on November 12th in the United States and other places, and then a week later in some other international territories. But it does have uh, the rest of Disney's library programming in place for people to try out. And Br- that includes... Brad, there's a, there's a lot of people at home listening to this being like, what do I care? I don't live in the Netherlands. Brad, tell me something I care about. Like, wh- Why should this matter to me? Well, this gives us just a good idea of the kind of content that uh, Disney is going to be putting within uh, this streaming service. So obviously we know a lot of things that are already a big deal that are going to be in there are Marvel movies and Star Wars and Pixar and that kind of thing. But there's some other lower key things that we didn't necessarily specifically hear about or know were coming. Uh, For example, since Disney now owns 20th Century Fox, one of the cool additions in the library uh, is X-Men the Animated Series from the 90s, which is a favorite among comic fans, kids who grew up in the 90s, uh, and that's available at, at, least, at least at launch uh, with this version of the app over in the Netherlands. And then uh, along on the Disney side of things, uh, other things that are included include a series of classic Mickey Mouse shorts. We're talking about old stuff from decades ago uh, that hasn't been made easily available uh, anywhere else on any other streaming services. And that also includes the Pixar shorts, which you could see, you know, on individual home video releases of Pixar movies or in the collected uh, shorts that come in their own packages. Uh, But here on Disney Plus, they're all listed individually. So you can just go and watch them by themselves and not have to, you know, go through an entire uh, volume or which one you want to watch. Well, we also get a sense for the uh, library of 4K and HDR content. There's a whole section dedicated to what is available in that high definition uh, format. You can't search for this content by typing like 4K or Ultra HD into the search bar, but it just has a specific section that lists all the titles that are available in that high resolution format. Right now, uh, for the soft pilot launch anyway, there's 17 titles in that section. Most of them are Marvel and Star Wars movies, which makes sense. Uh, And keep in mind this high resolution stuff, along with Dolby Atmos sound, is something that is being included with Disney Plus without any extra upcharge. So if you're paying the standard monthly fee, then you have access to whatever movies and TV shows they have in their library that are available in 4K Ultra HD or HDR. Yeah. Interestingly, you can't search for uh, 4K or HDR, but you can search for character. So you could like search like if I want Scrooge McDuck and it would come up with every single thing that Scrooge McDuck has been in from DuckTales to old cartoons to... You know, whatever. Yeah, yes. exactly. And, um, and for me, I think I think really the most exciting thing here is the all of the classic um, and sometimes I use the word classic loosely, but old <laughs> stuff that um, has kind of been forgotten or available in some kind of home video format. And a lot of that stuff is uh, animated series from the 90s, stuff like uh, the Mighty Ducks animated series and the Little Mermaid animated series. Uh the original, you know, Darkwing Duck and Chippendale Rescue Rangers. So I'll, I'll, it's it's cool to see uh, a lot of this stuff available in a you know in a easy streaming service. 
And it's interesting, too, the sections, like there's those like five or six different sections. It can be narrowed down into smaller sections. You There's like a section for the Muppets. So you get like all the Muppets stuff. Uh, that includes uh, even the old TV show, which has been hard to find, I think, on digital. Um, so that's kind of exciting. Uh, one thing I, I was interested, like I was watching some people searching. We have a video, like if you go to slashfilm.com, I'll link it in the show notes. There's a couple of videos of people like exploring the menus um, and you can like kind of see what that experience is like. Uh, I know uh, someone on Reddit asked if uh, Dinosaurs, the old uh, Jim Henson TV show is on there. It is not. But the but the animated movie Dinosaur is on there, so it's weird. What is and isn't on there? There, there isn't anything Fox on there yet. Is that uh, just because it's a beta test? I I'm not entirely sure if it's because it's a beta test or if because um, there's pr- probably deals that Fox had with other streaming outlets and channels and things like that that are probably still in place that won't expire until a certain time. Because Disney's already talked about, you know, the, the, their plans for franchises like Night at the Museum and Home Alone. And so surely those movies will end up being on Disney Plus at some point. Uh, but very much likely we'll have to wait until the deals for those movies uh, end up uh, wrapping up before they end up over there. Because uh, they got, it goes for the TV side, too. Because like I said, even though X-Men is on there, it seems like that's the only Fox-oriented show that is available on Disney Plus because uh, even The Simpsons isn't available on there yet, and uh, the entire series run of that is supposed to be available on Disney Plus at some point. So, yeah. Uh, do you have any uh, f- first impressions from all the video you you watched? I, I think my only downside from from watching all the video I I did is that I thought you know Netflix has so much content. Like they're just like adding like five things a day onto Netflix library, and it's hard to find any of it. And I was thinking Disney's library is is going to be a little bit less. Like you know, it's it's big stuff, but it's not going to be like you know they're adding five things a day, so it'd be easier to find the stuff. But I'm actually kind of surprised at how many sub menus you have to go down to get to you know some of these things. Like it's not you know it it almost seems like those five six sections is like almost too little. Um, I mean, I don't know, maybe, but it's but at the same time, this is. I'm sure it's something that will probably evolve as time goes on simply because they don't have such a huge selection yet. Obviously, Disney has, you know, a big library, uh, but it's not Netflix sized yet. And so it's I think it's something that will become better as time goes on. You know, I mean, you know, even when Netflix started their instant stuff, it wasn't nearly as sophisticated as it is now. So I think we just got to give them some time to, you know, figure out how they they want to present things. Yeah, uh, I know X-Men and Spider-Man, the animated cartoons were kind of a big surprise for people. I was a big fan of the X-Men in the 1990s. Uh, ben, Brad, did either of you watch those series? Oh, yeah, man. I loved both of those. And, and yeah, the Spider-Man show from, like, the mid-90s is on there as well. I'm really excited about that. Um, somebody on Twitter sort of ran down some of the pre-2000 Marvel shows uh, that are on Disney Plus in the Netherlands right now, and that includes Spider-Woman, Spider-Man from 1981, Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends, uh, X-Men, Iron Man, Fantastic Four, Incredible Hulk, Silver Surfer, and Spider-Man Unlimited. But uh, as Brad mentioned, just this one X-Men show is the only one available. Like X-Men Evolution or um, Wolverine and the X-Men are currently not available there yet. And as you guys mentioned too, like, you know, we're not 100% certain that these shows are going to be available in the United States when Disney Plus launches here on November 12th because there could be international rights deals that mean that some of these shows are only available in certain countries. But, um, yeah, as somebody who grew up loving, you know, the the big trifecta for me was X-Men the Animated Series, Spider-Man the Animated Series, and Batman the Animated Series. And that, those three shows, like, I spent so much of my childhood, you know, absorbing all of that, and, and it really, like those shows helped shape my love of, of those kinds of characters, you know, well before I, I picked up a comic book. Um, so yeah, they were, they were hugely influential for me personally. I would actually say the X-Men animated series is better than the movies have been, but uh, maybe that's just my opinion. I, I, I will, uh, I'll admit something embarrassing here. Um, when X-Men started, I, you know, I, I was there from the first episode watching it, and uh, I, I was so invested in this character named Morph, I think his oh, name was, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. who could morph into the different characters. And I think by the second episode, and I was like, why isn't he in the opening, like, you know, the opening animated sequence? I was yeah. like, so what? By the, I think, like, the second episode, he dies, and I, like, cried. 
Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> it's it was really sad, man. I, I wrote in the piece uh, in, in at Slash Film. I still remember Wolverine's like really pained reaction to losing Morph, and that was like the two parter pilot episode. And Morph dies in the second part of that. So yeah, you you had uh, a, a very small <laughs> amount of time to get invested in but Morph, Peter. But <laughs> am I am I misremembering this? But doesn't Morph come back at some point and he's a I, bad guy? I think he does. Yeah, but I don't remember if there was like some sort of you know it was actually. Um, you know, some other <laughs> shapeshifter character the whole time or something like that. I don't recall exactly. Yeah. I remember um, I used to like back in the day, I used to buy action figures and I would like, um, I don't know what they call it. Brad, you might know the name of it where you'd actually take pieces from different action figures and put them together and then like paint them like Frankenstein, an action figure. And I, I actually built my own morph action figure because they didn't have one at the time. So Man, oh, no, you were yeah. all in on morph. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't even know what, what that, that action figure thing is. That sounds awesome though. Yeah. Uh, I know there's a word for it. But anyways, people are going to email us. Uh, let's talk about one other uh, Disney plus thing. The Mandalorian, uh, people are wondering what parts of Legends are gonna is gonna be in the series. Uh, Brad, what do we know? Uh, we don't have any specifics on that yet, but it is very enticing that John Favreau did tease the idea that elements of the Star Wars Legend stories could be incorporated into the Mandalorian. Um, for those of you that may not know, Star Wars Legends are any of the stories, be it books, comic books, what have you. Uh, that originated in between the time that the uh, original trilogy concluded and throughout the prequels and basically before Lucasfilm uh, was bought by Disney. And when Lucasfilm was bought by Disney, uh, all those stories were thrust into the Legends category because they didn't want those to be canon anymore in order to make things less confusing for Star Wars fans, for general audiences, and they resituated it so that there was a whole Lucasfilm story group that approved anything that was written within the star wars universe was considered canon but since then there have and, been elements- and by the way it was it was funny at the time a lot of star wars fans freaked out like they it was kind of like a lot of the stuff that they loved over the years had been discounted and they yeah, were kind of sure. upset over it yeah and there were a lot of cool things that came out of you know those stories the uh, the character of mara jade was something that a lot of people loved and uh grand admiral thrawn but that latter character is someone that has come into Star Wars canon because they, uh, they've been uh, pushed into stories from Star Wars Rebels and now has their own book series and has popped up in comics. So they're starting to use pieces of legends that fans really liked and just uh, incorporating them into Star Wars canon in a new way. And so Favreau was asked about uh, whether or not we might see someone like Grand Admiral Thrawn or Mar Jade appear in The Mandalorian at some point. And this is what he said. He said, quote, I don't want to talk about anything that might be fun for people to discover. Uh, We do have conversations. Part of what's fun to see is if we could merge the world of the original trilogy, the prequels, the sequels, Clone Wars, and what's been considered canon up to this point, and what's 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 been considered part of Legends. I think this show offers an opportunity to bring all of those elements, no, so no matter what your flavor of Star Wars ice cream you like, there will be something to enjoy. But you're asking the right questions. So the fact that he says that there at the end means that there's probably some stuff within The Mandalorian that brings certain elements of Star Wars legend stories into Star Wars canon. Uh, what that might be, he's not willing to say, which means it's probably something that is meant to surprise fans. Uh, immediately what I'm thinking of is, Maybe something tied to Boba Fett will be brought into this because even though John Favreau has con- has already said Boba Fett will not appear in this first season of The Mandalorian, that doesn't preclude the possibility of there being teases or some kind of hint that Boba Fett is still alive, which is something that was a big part of Star Wars Legends. The fact that he survived falling into the Sarlacc pit and, and went on to have his own adventures after Return of the Jedi. So there's, I think there's a lot of possibilities here. Uh, so many cool stories from Legends could be used. Uh, for any of these Star Wars shows, and uh, I'm definitely excited to see what uh, what they bring to the fray with the Mandalorian. Yes, uh, let's move on from John Favreau, who's directing a Star Wars live action TV series next season, to the current director of the Star Wars Skywalker saga, J.J. Abrams, who uh, you know for a while there, it's been all these studios have been courting him, courting him because he's been uh, going to take Bad Robot, which had been at Paramount, and find a new home for it. And it looks like he has found the new home. Ben, who is it? 
Yeah, it's Warner Media. So um, Disney, Apple, and Warner Media were reportedly the top contenders who were really vying to lock down Abrams and his Bad Robot Productions. But uh, today, we found out that the Warner Media deal with uh, those entities has been signed. Uh, you know, it's it's done and it's actually effective immediately. Um, the financial details were not revealed specifically, but uh, the deal has been valued at around around $500 million. And actually some people, uh, insiders told Variety that it could be worth even more if certain performance related targets are reached. So um, this is a, a huge deal. It, it's supposed to last, uh, like I said, it starts immediately and it will initially run through 2024. So it's a five year deal that could potentially be uh, extended in the years to come if everybody is happy with the way that everything's going. Um, Abrams is going to write, produce, and direct uh, content for Warner Media, and that includes um, film stuff, that includes TV stuff, that includes video game stuff. Bad Robot has a TV, or a, I'm sorry, a video game division that they launched last year called Bad Robot Games. Um, they're going to be ma- making indie games and like AAA, like major titles for consoles and mobile and PC. So um, yeah, this is just like you know the peak TV sort of streaming <laughs> boom that we're in right now has been a really um, profitable era for a lot of huge A-list creators because. Uh, you know, these studios and, and streaming services and places like that are, are looking for name recognition uh, and they, they are banking on these people to produce quality stuff that's going to be like water cooler related discussions, you know, um, or that's going to generate those kinds of, of discussions. So people like Shonda Rhimes and Greg Berlanti and Ryan Murphy and Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy and the Game of Thrones creators, all of them have locked down huge, huge deals uh, over the past year or so. And now Abrams is the latest one to do the same thing. And I- I think Paramount was kind of upset that J.J. Abrams was, you know, had a deal with them, but was, you know, his focus was elsewhere. You know, he was making mm-hmm. Star Wars movies. Uh, you know, he did make some TV shows, but he wasn't like hands on in those. So it, it's I'm betting he's going to be way more hands on than the stuff like you're saying he's going to direct some of it. Um, I'm curious what that's going to be. There's been already some rumors that he could get his hands in the in the uh, DC universe because there's that uh, Superman script that he wrote you know a long time ago flyby that got, got a lot of buzz online um, so it's I'm, I'm interested to see what bad robot what kind of impact bad robot has at uh, Warner media because I feel like if you look back like five ten years ago bad robot was like felt like it was going to be such a huge force. And aside from the Star Wars stuff, it has not really had that huge of an impact on Hollywood. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you agree or disagree? Yeah, I, I think so. And I think, um, you know, about 10 years ago, Warner Brothers as a studio seemed very well positioned to be, you know, at, at the top of the pile, basically. And they have sort of dropped off dramatically as Disney has, you know, scooped up everything. Um, and I, I feel like this is a good match because, like you said, there just seems to be a lot of potential there for these two entities to team up and produce a lot of stuff that we care about, you know, for places like HBO and then HBO Max, the upcoming streaming service, like Abrams is launching uh, a, a new show called Demi Mondi, which is the first thing that he's written since Fringe and the first uh, show that he's solely created since Alias, I think. So, um, yeah, it seems like he has all of the creative juices flowing and, and now he has a home for all that stuff. I'm excited. Okay, let's move from the current director of Star Wars Episode Nine to the former director of Star Wars Episode Nine, Colin Trevorrow, who uh, has a Jurassic World short film, which is going to be hitting the television this weekend. Brad, what do we know? Yes, uh, before we uh, even get a first look at whatever Jurassic World 3 uh, will be, there's going to be a short film that debuts this weekend on FX after a showing of Jurassic World. Uh, on that very channel. It's called Battle at Big Rock. Uh, It was just announced out of nowhere this week, and it stars Andre Holland of Selma, Natalie Martinez from End of Watch, and a couple child actors named uh, Melody Hurd and Pearson Salvador. And uh, it takes place a year after the events of Fallen Kingdom, after dinosaurs were released into the wild, and will follow this family as they have an encounter with a couple, uh, at least a couple dinosaurs in the redwood forest of a national park in Northern California. It's uh, a short that runs about eight minutes long. It'll be available online immediately after it debuts uh, on FX, uh, but for people on the East Coast, it'll be a little bit late, probably closer to midnight, um, actually 1 a.m. Eastern time, uh, 12 a.m. Central time. 
uh, because it'll be available online around 10 p.m. Pacific time after it airs on FX on the West Coast. Um, there's a couple first look photos, none with dinosaurs for those who are interested in seeing them. But we do know that there will be uh, a couple new dinosaurs that we haven't yet seen uh, in the movie before. Uh, there is a uh, an Pseudoceratops, which Trevor described as a beautiful herbivore that feels like a Texas longhorn. And we're going to see a grown up Allosaurus uh, who we've seen the species in the franchise before, but only as a baby. And now in, uh, by the time the short comes along, it'll be full grown. Well, very cool. Um, the the interesting thing here. Well, first of all, there's a couple interesting things because I don't think there has ever been a movie franchise on the level of like a Jurassic World that has had like a short film air on TV in between the the episodes. I mean, I guess maybe like Star Wars: The Holiday Special, which had that Boba Fett short film in it, but it's like have you have you thought of any? Is there any? No. No, I couldn't think of anything as far as it, like a uh, an actual short film like this. Um, I I guess you could technically say the Animatrix, but that wasn't really exactly the same thing because that was like a whole collection of shorts. Um, so yeah, I guess I, that's pretty yeah. much it as far as I, I know. I think the closest thing I could think of was like those shorts that they made for um, like Blade Runner twenty forty nine and Alien Covenant that sort of filled oh, yeah. in some of those gaps. But those were just released online; they weren't on TV. So yeah, I think this is a this is new territory. Apparently, someone posted online that there uh, there were rumors of a Jurassic World short being attached to uh, Hobbs and Shaw. But they got squashed pretty quickly by Universal, and so maybe this was once intended to be like a special, you know, in theaters thing. But then they decided to push it back once the word started to get out. I, I don't know. Yeah, the the other interesting thing here, I think, is that we're seeing a one year time jump, which I think is going to be indicative of Jurassic World three, right? Like if we're jumping a year into the future, then Jurassic World three is probably going to take place after that. And we're going to see, you know, I, I guess this, this is a chance for the short film to explore what dinosaurs roaming free on our earth. I mean, spoiler alert for Jurassic world fallen kingdom. Uh, but I'm guessing that's the reason to have the short film. Yeah, I mean, if anything, and I think, Ben, uh, you were the one who mentioned this in Slack, th this probably means that they're not going to have much time in Jurassic World 3 to deal with the outside ramifications of what it's like to have dinosaurs in the wild, and this will be something that uh, satiates fans' desire to see what that might be like, because whatever the plot of 3 is, it'll probably be primarily focused on uh, whatever Chris Pratt and... Uh, Bryce Dallas Howard's characters are doing with regards to dinosaurs so that it's not going to be all about, oh man, dinosaurs unleashed. And since this does take place a year after uh, Fallen Kingdom, which did come out essentially a year ago, I wouldn't be surprised if by the time Jurassic World 3 comes out, they they probably have a real-time uh, passage of time within the, the narrative structure of Jurassic World. Good point. Okay, uh, let's move on from uh, from a big franchise movie to uh hollywood's return to the mid-budget dramas it seems like this new uh there's a new uh financing deal for the goldfinch that could be the template for that uh ben what do we know yeah so the goldfinch is a new movie from john crowley the director of brooklyn it's a 40 million dollar adaptation of a really popular novel the film stars um nicole kidman and uh, who's the the lead in that movie? It's uh, the name is escaping right Ansel now. Ansel Elgort. Yes, of course. How could I forget Ansel Elgort? <laughs> uh, yes, thank you for the assist, Brad. Um, so yeah, that's that's the Goldfinch. And this movie, uh, there's an interesting story in Vulture about how this movie got made, and I hadn't heard of anything like this happening before. So basically, what happened is Warner Brothers has teamed up with Amazon to co-finance this movie, and Warner Brothers Warner Brothers is going to be distributing the movie theatrically worldwide and then passing it off to Amazon Studios who has the video on demand streaming rights for it for the Amazon Prime Video platform so um, normally when a movie like this is made these studios own their own streaming services or their own outlets to you know continue the the downstream 
uh, pushing of this product and potentially make more money for themselves in the long run. But this is yeah, because of- I was gonna say we we all concentrate on like the box office and how much the box office. But for years, you know, there was the home video market, which DVDs and Blu-rays were a huge pusher of like how how successful a film could be. And then you know it was all about the library, having that library for the long term. But uh, now that could be changing. Yeah, so basically the um, the agent for John Crowley proposed this sort of unorthodox solution when budget talks were breaking down between the production company and the producers and the studio. And this agent was just like, what if Warner Brothers teamed up with Amazon to raise the money to make the movie? And that kind of thing is not something that I would have expected uh, for any of the studios to actually accept. But Tommy, Toby Emmerich, who is the um, chairman of the Warner Brothers Pictures uh, group actually he's quoted as saying this could be a game changer for our business model this is a great model for us it creates a model that potentially allows warner brothers to make dramas or urban skewing or domestic skewing films for a higher budget through a partnership with amazon so um you know the interesting thing here is as i mentioned about that sort of downstream thing warner brothers uh is owned by warner media warner media also owns hbo so you would think that typically if a movie is made by Warner Brothers, that's the outlet that you would see it, um, you know, sort of end up at. Um, this Goldfinch deal was made before HBO Max was announced. So it seems like there aren't going to be, you know, any new deals like this between Warner Brothers and Amazon because Warner Brothers wants to keep stuff for their new library and, and their new streaming service. But, um, you know, even though Disney has Disney Plus and Universal is soon, soon going to be having uh, the untitled NBC Universal streaming service, there are still places, studios out there, Lionsgate, Focus, Paramount, Sony, that don't really have um, their own viable streaming services yet that could theoretically make deals like this in the future with a company like Amazon. And that could could be, like you're saying, Peter, sort of the return to the sort of mid-budget type of movie that we have all been decrying you know that we haven't been seeing very much um you know in in the past 20 years unfortunately it doesn't look like the goldfinch is any good it it premiered at what toronto i think one of the film festivals and i think it currently has a 29 percent on the tomato meter which is when you when you get a score that low you it almost has to be like very bad (laughs) like, <laughs> well, the good thing is it doesn't matter if the Goldfinch is any good for this business model to continue yeah. existing. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'm just wondering, like, because this movie was bad, will two studios not come together again? Oh, Do you know will it like... have a stink on it just because of the quality of the product? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, uh, we have one last story. This one broke right before we started recording, and that is that Paul Feig is a... Uh, I guess uh, entering the dark universe or the, the the world of universal monsters, Brad. What do we know? Yeah, even though the dark universe is basically dead after the mummy totally shit the bed, unintentional rhyme. Um, if Paul Feig <laughs> is uh, doing something involved with Universal Monsters with a project called Dark Army. Uh, unfortunately, there's very little to glean from what this uh, movie is supposed to be about. Feig is going to write and direct the movie. Uh, and it's said to include characters from Universal's classic, classic monster library and original characters created by Feig. So it sounds to me uh, like we're going to get, see more Universal monsters, but with a more original spin than just redoing the origins and trying to create a new franchise of horror movies involving uh, those classic monsters. And maybe it's just um, me, you know, putting Feig into a corner, but I, I wonder if maybe he's going to do something akin to what Universal used to do with Abbott and Costello and the Universal Monsters, because there's a, a whole series of films following the comedy duo Abbott and Costello as they meet the various Universal Monsters, and uh, I doubt it'll be something as simple as, you know, having just the characters run into those uh, monsters, but it, that would be a fun premise to explore. I, I, I don't know if I ever mentioned it on this podcast or if i mentioned it in slack or an article or something but after dark universe failed i thought it would be kind of a cool idea to do something along the lines of this is the end with people like seth rogan and jonah hill um where they end up encountering you know some of the universal monsters so i don't know if that's what feig has in mind here uh it's not necessarily a guarantee that this will even be a comedic approach just recently he went to a little bit more of a twisted place with that uh thriller a simple favor 
And uh, he does do some more uh, things that aren't so comedic in the Ghostbusters reboot. As, as much as there is slapstick comedy and stuff like that in that movie, uh, some of the ghosts and stuff actually did have a pretty, uh, you know, gruesome, supernatural uh, terror feel to them. So there, there is, the, you know, a possibility that he could do something that leans more into horror and less out of comedy. But again, you know, comedy and horror kind of, dip their toes into the same arenas every now and then, you know, when you get scared, uh, sometimes you feel like laughing. Uh, and so it's, it'll be interesting to see what he can do with uh, something like the universal monsters. Yeah. I mean, I would love to see like his version of the monster squad. I feel like that could be interesting and cool. It, it's weird that they're calling this dark army when they just killed off the dark universe, because I feel like they would want to get rid of the word dark, but I don't know, I guess. <laughs> Um, we'll have to keep an eye on this as we learn more. Uh, you can read that story and all the stories we've talked about on today's podcast linked in the show notes on, and on slashfilm.com. This podcast, Slash Film Daily, is published every weekday on iTunes, Google, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Please feel free to send your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to us at peter at slashfilm.com. And please rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends. Spread the word. And we'll see you tomorrow.